Hey, good morning, everybody in this room. Hello, good morning, everybody. Hello, and everybody who's tuning in online, welcome to New Day. I'm Aaron Winowiski. I'll be teaching this morning. And if you're coming in here and you have anything that you're worried about, anything that has been keeping you up at night, you are in the right place. The instructions from Jesus, what he said is anything you're worried about, you can let it go. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and his righteousness, a right relationship with him and everything else he'll take care of. So today is about seeking God's kingdom. And what does that mean? And especially in an election year when politics are so divisive in our culture, in our neighborhoods, even within families, we're going to learn about following Jesus together, even when politics divide. So you're in the right place. Now, Jesus said everything in our lives is connected to how we love God and how we love people. So in this room, rather than sitting at, uh, in, in rows, we're sitting in tables because relationships happen better when we can see each other eye to eye. And if you're tuning in online, we encourage you to have other people in the room with you. Have a conversation. Because we also know that transformation happens not just from the, the, the message of the teaching that you hear, but from the conversations that happen afterwards. So we encourage you, even if you're online, participate in the chat. Uh, be part of the conversation, part of the community, part of the relationships. It's all about relationships. Uh, and we also are going to have a time built in for reflection because we know that this morning is about more than you learning what God taught me. God has something to teach you this morning. I can't possibly know what you've been through this week, uh, it, it, let alone through your whole life. I want to point you to God so we'll build in time for reflection for you to consider, God, what are you teaching me? And then to respond to him with what you're willing to do about that and who you're willing to share that with. We call that our RAD pattern of discipleship, R-A-D, reflection, application, and discussion. And uh, we have uh, to, to help you with that, uh, we, we have these rad journals uh, where you can write down some of the thoughts that you're having, where you can uh, write down what you feel like God is teaching you and what you're willing to do about it. We're much more likely to remember what we write down and what we discuss. We're much more likely to do what other people are going to ask us about. So uh, it's all about discipleship, not just learning learning to follow Jesus together. So as we go into the teaching time this morning, let's pray. God, we thank you that you have given us hope. You have given us promises that as we seek your kingdom and your righteousness, you'll take care of everything we need. I pray, God, that we would collectively this morning take a deep breath and remember that when Jesus calls followers, he promises that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. And let us go uh, out of here this morning with uh, a plan to follow you more closely and to experience greater peace in our lives. Amen. Uh, we're glad to be in a church where the bumper stickers in the parking lot don't match. That's something that I started saying 15 years ago or so. The idea being, it's okay to come from different political parties uh, to come together into a room and worship Jesus being united in him. That was such an important part of the, the fabric of who we are that we formalized it into one of three core values 
that New Day has. We have three core values. We're relational, we're biblical, and we're missional. And that first core value about being relational, we say we're a church that's about authentic relationships, people with significant differences finding unity in Christ. So when I went to a, a pastor's breakfast in 2011 with pastors from around this area, uh, and, and I'm rewinding back to 2011 because there were some political things going on at that time. When I sat down in that breakfast and, uh, and, and we were talking about things that are happening in our churches and things happening in our communities, I was surprised when a discussion started with a, the with a question, so how are you, other pastors, other church leaders, how are you handling the uh, Scott Walker working towards removing collective bargaining for public school teachers. And I, truly, I was truly clueless. Like, what do you mean, how are we handling that? I thought, I thought this, the state government was handling that. What, what does the church have to do with, uh, with what the governor is doing and, and public school teachers? What does the church have to do with that. I was truly clueless uh, about that. Um, I thought we were pretty cutting edge by saying, well, look at Jesus and his 12 closest followers. He had a tax collector who would raise money that supported the Roman occupation of Jerusalem and he also had Simon, who was a zealot, as the zealots were a, a, a violent insurrectionist group. They were basically terrorists, and their whole job, their, their mission was to violently overthrow Roman oppression over Jerusalem. So you have one person who's uh, spent their career funding this thing, and one person who's uh, spent his career working on removing it, two, like, Talk about opposite political positions, and, and, and yet when you open Scripture and look for where did Jesus weigh in on who was more right in these opposite positions? How many conversations do we observe that happen around the, the campfire where these topics are, are discussed? It's just not there. So I'm coming into this pastor's breakfast with that kind of attitude and that kind of teaching and thinking, why would we even bring it up, what's happening in the state government, when that's not what the writers of the Gospels, the writers of Scripture, that's not what they prioritized. That's not what they said was most important, the political arguments of the day. Why would we prioritize that? So I thought we were pretty cutting edge in that way, and that, that we had unmatching bumper stickers, so to speak, in our parking lot. We had uh, lifelong Republicans and lifelong Democrats, people who were passionate on, on different sides of political issues. And it turns out that maybe we were just living in the past, a magical time of years gone by when people could disagree without disengaging from each other because political division has become measurably worse over the last few decades and that division is causing immense damage how do we know the division is real uh, there are there have been studies done the percentage of people who have a very unfavorable view of the other major political party has grown from under 20% in 1994 to well over 50% in 2022. This is basically a measure of division and how it's grown since 1994. People who will have a hard time hanging out with people from a different political party. It's not just a negative view of the party, it is a negative view of people who associate with the party. Um, in, in 1960, 4% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats said that they would be displeased if their son or daughter married someone from the other political party. It was 4% in 1960, and then by 2019, it was 45% of Democrats 
and 35% of Republicans said they would be upset if their son or daughter married someone from the opposite political party. And there are a lot of factors contributing to this. And there's policy factors like gerrymandering and election financing that allow candidates with more extreme positions to make it into office. And there are technological factors like 24-7 cable news that has its uh, left and its right, and they're going all the time. There are algorithms that give us more of what the algorithm thinks we'll agree with. They just feed us more, and, and we don't get to see the, the other side of issues. The biggest factors, though, are hardwired into us. God made us for relationships. He made us for community. We have a longing inside us, a longing to belong. We all have a longing to belong. So the tension that I was hearing about in that pastor's breakfast in 2011 in evangelical churches in central Wisconsin came from the fact that they were almost entirely composed of Republicans, except there were also some people who are teachers in the public school system. The churches, though, were almost entirely Republicans, and so when a group gets together, like a church, they have a tendency to think and talk favorably towards each other and negatively towards an opposing group. So if you have a church that's almost entirely one political persuasion, there probably is an opening for some people to talk negatively about a different political persuasion, and then for other people to kind of join in and to be a part of that. It's part, it becomes part of a group identity. It actually feels good to us to minimize the other, sometimes even to demonize, to act like people aren't really people. All of that leads to people adopting the values of the group in order to continue belonging. And then the group works together to validate and justify itself through its interpretation of reality. We all are a part of this going on to some extent. We're all bringing into our daily lives something that comes from the, the way we were brought up, the group that we were a, a part of, the group that we are a part of now. And we assume that people use independent thought when we talk about politics, when we talk about political parties, that they weigh out each issue and then choose the political party that most matches their personal convictions about those issues. More often, what, what actually happens is we change our position on the issues to match what our group is saying. So we feel like we belong. So imagine being in a church in 2011 where being a political conservative is part of that group identity, whether it's talked about from the front or not. I mean, we can pick up on clues about what is true in, in this group. Imagine being a part of that group and getting the sense that there's a, a strong connection to, a strong affiliation with conservative politics. And if you're a teacher in a public school and you see that this particular policy stands to damage your family, and yet if you say something against a policy from a conservative governor, well, that conservative governor in this church setting is thought of as one of us. If you speak ill against one of us, if you're going to say, I disagree with the Republican governor, well, isn't that essentially saying that you would prefer to have a Democrat as governor 
And at that point, aren't you just a liberal? And at that point, are you even a Christian? Like this is how the, 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 the logic goes when people prioritize politics, when that becomes part of the identity and when that identity becomes part of the church. That kind of in-group bias and polarization has continued over the years. It's gotten worse and worse. In 2017, Ed Stetzer, who at the time was the director of the Billy Graham Center, he was interviewed on national public radio. So Ed Stetzer, major leader in, uh, in, in evangelical Christianity in America, went on national public radio to help people who are listening to public radio. There's a, a, a large uh, left-leaning audience listening to national public radio, and they truly couldn't understand in 2017 midterm uh, election situation there was a politician in Alabama who was running for office on a conservative platform, and it, it became clear that he had some issues, um, issues with inappropriate relationships with teenagers. He had been banned from the local shopping mall because things had gotten so bad, and he's on a conservative platform. He's being supported by evangelical Christians who, as, as I said before we even started the teaching time, um, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Uh, and, and there are people who are saying, yeah, that's, that's our, our belief, a right relationship with God and a right relationship with other people. You would think that when those realities came to light that that people who are prioritizing the kingdom of God and his righteousness would go yeah maybe this isn't uh maybe this isn't our guy maybe this isn't the best reflection of um of our values and instead in light of the criticism from the left white evangelical Christians in Alabama actually increased in their support of this candidate when those things came to light. So a lot of the people on the left are scratching their heads and going, how is this? What We thought we understood what evangelical Christianity was about, but obviously we don't because that doesn't make any sense. So Ed Stetzer went on uh, a radio show to kind of represent evangelical Christianity and to help people understand what's going on there. And he said that what's happening more and more often is that Christians are recalibrating their morality to accommodate a political candidate. Recalibrating their morality to accommodate a political candidate. And he said, it's a huge problem. He didn't go on the radio show to say, well, here's why that makes sense. He went on the radio show to say, here's why it's happening, and it's not okay. Uh, he said in that interview, he said, to change your views on morality in order to support a candidate is deeply troubling. We need to disciple people better so that they actually think biblically, not politically, about every issue. Ed Stetzer said that before 2020. Now, my goal in this series, as we talk about following Jesus together when politics divide, is to do as Stetzer suggested, to disciple anyone who will listen into thinking biblically about every issue, prioritizing God's kingdom over politics. What I've observed is people participating in a church and prioritizing politics. We want to talk about prioritizing God's kingdom while still participating in, in politics. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we 
run away from important decisions that affect our friends, family, neighbors. The, the decisions made in government affect real people, and we're to love people. So I'm not suggesting that we disassociate from what's happening politically. We're going to talk about how to prioritize the kingdom while participating politically. And I know I'm not perfect in accomplishing this. Uh, it, it has always been my goal, though. So to think biblically, not just politically, about every issue, we need to be clear about participating in politics, prioritizing the kingdom. So what is the kingdom? I keep using that word. What does that mean? Our third, fourth, and fifth graders who are in the room have a, uh, a Club 345 rad journal, and there is a space in there where they're encouraged to draw what they think of when they hear the word kingdom. Now, a lot of us, if we were to draw what we think of when we hear the word kingdom, would draw a castle with high towers, thick walls. When Jesus used that word, there were kingdoms. And so people probably thought about King Herod and his palace. They probably thought about uh, the Roman Empire and the, the, uh, the armies that kept Rome in power uh, across all the places that they occupied. Jesus was talking about a different kind of kingdom, though, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Those two terms are used uh, to mean the same thing. We, read, we see them both in Scripture. They mean the same thing. He talked about it a lot, starting at the very beginning of his ministry, after his baptism, Mark chapter 1, the first chapter of Mark's gospel. Jesus went into Galilee in verse 14, where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. That's how he started his ministry, by talking about the kingdom of God. Matthew said it this way in his gospel. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. From then on, Matthew says. So that makes it sound like this wasn't just something he said in one sermon. He was saying over and over again, turn away from your selfishness, your sinfulness, turn to God, the kingdom is near. Luke recorded Jesus saying this, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns. This is Jesus talking. Because that is why I was sent. The kingdom of God is part of the purpose for Jesus humbling himself from his position in heaven and coming to earth. The kingdom of God isn't like the kingdoms of the world, though. When you read through the Gospels, you see that Jesus doesn't describe it like a fortified castle or a political empire. He says the kingdom of God is like a farmer who plants seeds. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grows into a tree. The kingdom of God is like yeast in bread. The kingdom of God is like a treasure discovered in a field. The kingdom of God is like a merchant searching for choice, pe uh, tro choice pearls or like a landowner hiring workers. The kingdom of God isn't owned by the rich. It is inherited by the poor. He takes what we think of as a kingdom, and he turns it upside down and says the kingdom of God isn't like the power structures of this world. The kingdom of God is not a realm as much as it is a reality. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 20, one day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Because they're thinking of it as a political rule and reign. When are you going to 
bring in the armies of heaven and overthrow Rome, when is the kingdom of God going to come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. Huh? You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. Imagine what a head scratcher that was. The kingdom of God is already present. So the kingdom of God is a presence, a present reality, and at the same time, it's something we're to pray for and look forward to. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, this is very familiar to a lot of people who grew up in this area. Jesus teaching about prayer. He says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your, I know you can finish this, a lot of you, kingdom come. Yeah, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. People have been saying this, like maybe some of you grew up in a tradition where you have said this thousands of times in, in, in your life, praying for God's kingdom to come. Maybe you haven't thought a lot about, what is, well, what does that mean? This passage might be the best place for us to lay a foundation for understanding the kingdom of God. What happens a lot of times in the Psalms and in other areas of Scripture where poetry is used is a, a literary tool called parallelism, where there's a statement made and then a second statement is designed to reinforce or amplify or clarify the first statement. So when we say your kingdom come, well, what does it mean for God's kingdom to come? It means his will being done on earth as it is in heaven, where God is reigning all the time and his will is unhindered. There, there are no rebels in the presence of God's throne room in heaven. The rebels are here. So God's kingdom coming is when rebels repent, turn away from our rebellion, turn away from demanding that I'm the king of my life and instead turning to God and saying, you are the king of my life. May your will be done in my heart, in my household, in my neighborhood, in my community. May your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven, there we see the kingdom of God, where the will of God is done on earth, in our hearts, in our households, in our neighborhoods, in our community, on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is a present reality that we turn to when we repent, when we turn away from our sinful gravity and move towards obedience, towards God's will. That's how the kingdom of God can be a here and now reality and also what we look forward to because it isn't happening perfectly right now. We can point to lots of ways that heaven is not what we see on earth. And yet we know when we read scripture that there will be a day where Jesus comes back, where he makes all things new, where heaven and earth become one. So we look forward to that. And in the meantime, we get glimpses of it when we turn to him as king, when we step off the throne of our own hearts and invite him to take that position. Even after all his teaching, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his closest followers, after all of this teaching about the kingdom of God, his closest followers were still imagining a political kingdom. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, 
They kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Oh, imagine the patience that Jesus had. (laughs) Because in his ministry, it says that he taught about the kingdom all the time. And now it says that his closest followers are asking about the kingdom all the time. Is it happening now? Is it going to come now? Is this the time? When's the power coming? Angel armies, come on now. Now? Now? When Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit came upon each person who had repented from their sins, believed Jesus to be the Christ, which means Messiah, which means anointed one, which means king. So when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying Jesus the king. Everyone who believed Jesus to be the king, the Christ, that's when the reality of the kingdom of God became clearer to them. Jesus had told them, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you, and surely I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. And then when they were saying, is it, when, now is it going to happen now? Now do we get the kingdom? And he said, Ugh, the power of the Holy Spirit will come on you and you will be my witnesses locally, nearby, across cultures, and around the world. That was his answer. I'll be with you always. The Holy Spirit will be a power within you. You will make disciples of all nations. This became clearer to them in the book of Acts because it wasn't going to be people pledging their allegiance to a king in a far-off castle. The king himself is present. The bad news is that we're all in a condition of rebellion because we're all part of a fallen world where each person has declared themselves king of their lives. Repentance is turning from our selfishness, acknowledging him as king, yielding our lives to his kingdom, his authority. It's like asking him, what are you teaching me, God? And responding with what you're willing to do about that and who you're willing to share it with. That pattern of discipleship that we're practicing on Sunday mornings here, that we're encouraging you to live throughout the week, it's a pattern that's uh, simple to explain to someone else, even though it's not easy to live out. That pattern of discipleship is about his kingdom advancing in your heart. His kingdom ruling in your life. His kingdom isn't like earthly governments that manage people's behavior by threat and reward, by laws that are held over you. In his kingdom, he's with us, giving us the power to live with meaning and purpose according to his good plan because he loves us. It's not about the power over you that a government can have. It's power within you. As his kingdom rules more and more in our hearts, we do his will in our households as it is in heaven. As his will is done in our households as it is in heaven. Our households do his will in our neighborhoods as it is in heaven. As our neighborhoods do his will more and more in our community, our communities look more like heaven. And so on. So people who pledge their allegiance to Jesus the King, who turn their turn from their selfish ways day by day to seek and follow his will, Jesus has a word for those people. It's disciples. And there are people from every background, every ethnicity, every political party who have become disciples of Jesus. They're living stones in the worldwide church that Jesus builds. That's the group that I want to associate with. 
that's the group that I want to be a part of. I hope you're hearing me. Ethnicities from around the world, political parties, all different kinds, languages, that's the group. People with significant differences finding unity in Christ, the King. Despite what they may claim, there is no politician or political party that perfectly contains or reflects the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So here's a relief. We can stop defending them. We don't have to act like a particular politician is doing everything right. It's okay to have thoughts and opinions and to discuss those thoughts and opinions. We don't need to cancel each other. We need to listen and understand each other. Because our call is to prioritize the kingdom of God and then to participate in the kingdoms of this world in a way that he leads us, and he is going to lead us, God is going to lead us in different directions with different priorities, different ministries, different uh, levels of compassion for different situations. He'll lead us in different ways. Praise the Lord. Thank God that we're not all the same. So he'll lead us in different ways. Differences are inevitable. Division is a choice. Differences are inevitable when the mission is to make all disciples, or uh, make disciples of all people groups. That is the mission. I might ruffle some feathers here. That is the mission. The mission is not to save America. The mission is to save Americans. And when we lead with our political affiliation, whether it's in face-to-face discussions or online, or if we were to, in, in this group, instead of prioritizing that we are relational, biblical, and missional, if people were to come in, And to say, I can tell right away what political party uh, these people subscribe to. What we do when we do that is cut ourselves off from half of America. Half of the people who Jesus died for. Division cripples the church. It cuts us off from the opportunity to share the good news of the kingdom. So in the coming weeks, we'll learn more from God about how to acknowledge differences, because there are differences. There are some things that are more consistent with his righteousness than other things. We're going to acknowledge that. While also resisting the pressure to divide ourselves from other people. For now... I hope you're willing to humble yourself enough to say to Jesus the King, not my will, but yours be done. To follow Jesus together, we have to prioritize his kingdom over our politics. So right now, let's practice that pattern of reflection and application and discussion. I'm going to give you just a few minutes of quiet reflection just, this is just quiet time for you to prayerfully, quietly ask God, what are you teaching me today? I believe he has something to point out in your life. That were you to do something a little bit different this week, you would be more in line with his kingdom and his righteousness. He knows what that is. I can't tell you. And as he points that out, 
How will you respond? What will you do? Write down something that you're willing to do because it's his will for you. So we're going to have this time of quiet reflection. I encourage you to write something down because after the time of quiet reflection, we're going to give you a few minutes to just have a discussion at your table, to have a conversation about what's God teaching you? What are you willing to do about it? Who are you going to share that with this week? So take time to reflect on that, and then we'll reconnect for discussion. I hope um, God has brought something to mind for you this morning um, and that he's given you a step to take, even a simple step. This doesn't have to be a, a life-changing thing. What we discover is that life change often happens when we put small steps together over time. So a small step, something that will be different this week because you spent time hearing from God and considering his will for your life. That's uh, a taste of discipleship. That's a taste of the kingdom of God. So let's take time to encourage each other by having a discussion. If you're participating online, you can share in the chat what you feel like God is teaching you, what you're willing to do about it. And we'll catch up with you guys next week as we continue this series that I'm really excited about and also a little bit, uh, a little bit nervous. Uh, it's a little bit tender for me. Uh, God was bringing to mind for me during that time of reflection, like maybe I should message some of the people who have... Uh, left this church because of political reasons. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> so that's why I said maybe. I still, I still got to pray on that one. Um, the prayer has to be, though, uh, not my will, but, but, but yours be done. So 
let that be your continued prayer as you walk in obedience to him, and we'll catch up with you guys next week. Uh, so take some time to discuss.